Hello, hello. Okay, let's start this episode with a little bit of imagination. Take a moment and travel back in time with us to the later years of the golden age of Hollywood. It's a Friday night. You got your allowance from your parents, so you're out on the town with your friends. The local drive-in is playing the newest flick, but you're all a little early, so you stop at your favorite soda shop for some pre-show candy and a freshly made cherry soda float. One of the other kids from school who are crowded into the shop finds themselves near the jukebox, so they put on a song that is sure to get the night started. Yakety Yak by the Coasters. Soon, the entire teenage crowd is singing along and trying to outshout each other with the number one tagline from the tune, Yakety Yak, don't talk back. When it starts to get darker, you and your friends start chatting about which film of the night is going to be better. The new one on the main screen or one of the older double features on the second screen with either that hunk James Dean or the girl next door, Audrey Hepburn. Neither Kat or I could choose between the two of them, so we're bringing you both classic Hollywood actors in today's episode and deep diving into their lives, both on and off of the big screen. Let's first dive into our fun facts, though. I've already teased a little bit of mine, but here it is. Hollywood films in the 1950s were majorly under threat by one fast-growing piece of technology, television. People were able to watch TV in their homes since the 1930s, but it wasn't until the 50s that pretty much every single house was sitting down to watch shows in the evening. Another threat was the fact that many people were moving into suburbs as the men came home from the war, married, and started families. Smaller movie theaters in the outskirt areas were declining fast because of the migration, but we do get to see a rise in the drive-in movie theaters as teenagers start to have more of a social life than they did before the post-war societal changes. Huh. That kind of reminds me of how um, like movie theaters now started freaking out again over streaming services. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the same thing to happening again. It's like, okay, if, if movie theaters could survive TVs being put in people's homes, I feel like they can probably survive streaming services and they could probably outlast whatever comes after that as well. There's something about a movie theater that's just so, it's just, it's, there's such a sense of community you're watching this film but you're watching it with so many other people that are like interested in at least something the same as you you're watching it with your friends you're watching it with your family you're watching it with your lover like yeah it, there's there's something so much more social about a movie theater that really can't translate the same like in the same sort of way to watching movies at home yeah and like i remember um watching um parkland in a movie theater and mm -hmm. the feeling of that communal feeling of everybody at the end of the movie just sitting there shell shock kind of like their spirits coming back into their bodies whereas at least like a good two minutes before anybody really even moved and then that slow clap starting throughout the entire audience until like basically almost like a standing ovation in the middle of a movie theater mm -hmm. like those kind of things are just so special Mm, like you've been through this mass experience together and it's yeah. so personal on the one hand but at the same time you're all going through it at the same time exactly yeah wow my fun fact is that i forgot to find a fun fact <laughs> again <laughs> there, listen there's so much about audrey's life and i feel like i just took a crash course but there's like so many little stories and anecdotes and like so much about her so like any kind of any kind of fun fact was just kind of like thrown in amongst the rest like okay well i could add a fun fact yeah. for you then on audrey hepburn yeah you know what actually that'd be interesting because you actually know something about my subject this time so yes yeah, i know a lot of and we'll see if because <laughs> because yeah because you know you probably know actually so much more about audrey hepburn than me so in this case this is like hey i looked into this person that you know about already here's what i found so this is actually interesting what do you know and then we'll see if it shows up in my script at all i know that there's a lot of rumors that audrey hepburn absolutely did not like james dean <laughs> That's a very fitting fun fact. I did not find any information about James Dean whatsoever. No, in because research. she didn't like her. Like, she did not like him. Was there, like, something specific or just, like, in general? I don't... So, I'm, I know for a fact that James Dean and Marilyn Monroe never actually met. Mm. Um, I don't know if... I can't remember if, they, if him and Audrey had met or not. 
But I know that, like, from what I've seen about, like, her, like, the two of them, Audrey didn't like a lot of, like, the talk around James Dean. Mm. Which, you kind of see a little bit of it, but, like, he was kind of known as, like, a ladies' man and, like, and stuff like that, but also as a man's man, too. Okay. So, like, his reputation, she didn't even like apparently she didn't even care to want to get to know him but it was like no i'd rather stay clear (laughs) all right so see i'm i'm doing a search now and i'm finding images of them together but it looks photoshopped there's also a sleeping with sirens song uh if i'm james dean you're audrey hepburn which is funny considering it's a romantic love song kind of that seems to suggest that they liked each other at all so (laughs) It's actually hilarious how many James Dean songs I've heard or songs with references to James Dean versus how few songs about Audrey Hepburn I've heard from, like, more modern artists. Like, Hilary Duff did a whole song about James Dean. Yeah, I was thinking about that when we were, when I was writing Audrey Hepburn's script and I was thinking about what we were recording today. I, like, I couldn't get that song out of my head. (laughs) It was like, oh, the nostalgia hit me like a brick. Right? If you're like nothing like him, then don't call me friend because you're nothing like me. <laughs> oh, man. I think um, I think that album was out when I went and saw her live. You saw her live? Yeah. It was... Middle school Kate would have killed for that. Um, it was my <laughs> first concert, like, real concert. Mm. My first concert was when I was four and I went and saw Trisha Yearwood at the Peony with my mom and her best friend. But, like, my first, like, real concert was the Hillary Deaf concert. And then a family mm-hmm. friend of ours had taken her daughter to the same concert, but we didn't wow. know them yet. <laughs> oh, wait, cool. <laughs> um, and then later on, like, all, like, my mom, the family friend, and then her daughters and I, we would all be at the same Taylor Swift concerts for, like, at least two Taylor Swift concerts, I want to say. That's wild. Like, we weren't always sitting together. Like, I was always just off with one of with some of my friends, and then my mom and her would be sitting together, and then her kids would be off with, like, their friends. <laughs> but, like, yeah, like, we ended up being, like, a, quite a few concerts together. But I'm pretty sure that that was the same album that was out when I went and saw Hillary in concert. It was a good concert. It was a good album. Yeah. All right. Shall we get into it, then? Yeah. Cool, cool. I'm so curious about this Audrey Hepburn James Dean thing. I want to dig into this more. I just <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I am super excited to be talking about one of my favorite actors, like ever. <laughs> he has been my desktop wallpaper many times since I first started watching his films, which actually made for great discussion during one of my forensic anthropology classes. <laughs> so, a quick personal story before we get into this, just because it's a very interesting story. One of my regular table mates um, during this class actually had a past job working on facial recognition slash recreations, and so she'd been curious about what, like, what some of like, the celebrities who had died young would have looked like if they gotten to like, actually age. So she had right. used the program to age them off of photos just before they had passed. And one of the ones that she had done was James Dean. That's so cool. (laughs) When she saw my desktop wallpaper, she admitted that he was kind of lucky to have died young because he wouldn't have aged well at all and his career would have likely derailed due to the change in his looks. Okay, to be fair, according to her program, and to be fair, facial reconstructive surgery exists. People get Botox all the time. So there's like human-made factors that come into play that don't with a natural aging program. But like, (laughs) that's kind of funny though. (laughs) right i'm like but he was so freaking hot and she's like yeah he wasn't gonna age well though oh no oh no and separate right? but i'm like it's an okay. interesting theory but i'm not quite sure i agree with it um but we'll get into those details later <laughs> so cat what do you know about james dean other than what i've already told you um He's a rebel without a cause, a rebel to the first degree. Uh, I literally, <laughs> like, it's just the, the Hillary Duff song. Like, that's like, and I know, I know that, I know the Hillary Duff song. I know that he's got a uh, car that's supposedly haunted, according to Supernatural, that is somehow involved with his death. There were some freak accidents that happened with the car. I know that those existed. I don't remember exactly what they are. 
yeah it's just it's it's ghost stories and it's music because my brain is a confusing place <laughs> <laughs> okay well we're gonna have to have a movie night um <laughs> but first i'll give you some details about the man so james byron dean was born february 8th 1931 in marion indiana he was an only child and had had a fairly difficult childhood the family moved from Indiana to California soon after, as his father went from farming to being a dental technician. When James was nine years old, his mother passed suddenly with what we now know um, was uterine cancer. Mm. He was very close to his mom, where it is said that she was the only one who would actually understand him. James's father wasn't able to care for him. So he was sent back to Indiana to live with his aunt and uncle, where he was raised in a Quaker household. James and his father never really came to an understanding about this arrangement, um, especially when his father remarried after serving in World War II. His lack of family connections really haunted him for the rest of his short life. While in Indiana with his uncle and aunt, um, it is widely believed that James was sexually assaulted by a Methodist pastor that he is said to have had a close connection with. Aww. According to a book called Boulevard of Broken Dreams, The Life, Times, and Legend of James Dean by Paul Alexander, it is reported that James had confided in Elizabeth Taylor about his abuse that happened about two years after his mother's death, making him about 11 years old when this happened. The same pasture is considered to be the reason for James's obsessions over bullfighting, car racing, and theater later in his life. It is an interesting dynamic and situation when a person that you really care for enough to kind of develop the same hobbies and interests as them also does something so horrendous to you. Yeah. Like, if, if he felt so close to this guy that he ended up liking these same things unless like like what that's just that's really heartbreaking that level of betrayal like this isn't just anybody this is someone that he looks up to well i'm wondering if even though he was abused by the pastor i'm wondering if this is somebody who was like a one constant in his life at this point because mm -hmm. from what like i saw like i don't think he got along well with his aunt and uncle his father abandoned him basically um, and he lost the only person that really actually understood him. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not surprised. Like, it's super sad. But I'm honestly really not surprised. Yeah. Aww. So, once James finished high school in 1949, he moved back to California with his dog, Max, to attend Santa Monica College. While we might think that he was automatically studying theater, that is not the case at all. He actually studied pre-law. Like, he, he was a smart law? man. Yeah, he was so smart. Yeah, I was expecting because his dad went from being a farm farmer to a dentist that he was going to do something medical and, like, follow in the dentist, but, like, law? <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Pre-law was not long-lived, however, as he transferred to UCLA for a semester, resulting in a change of majors to drama. So nice. this didn't go over well with Daddy Dearest, whom he was living mm. with. And he was estranged fairly quickly. By Oof. 1951, he dropped out of UCLA to pursue his career after he appeared in a Pepsi Cola commercial. He did get some small walk on roles um, after the co commercial, but was mostly making his money as a parking attendant at the CBS lot until he was discovered there by Rogers Brackett. Brackett assisted the young actor with his craft and ultimately got him a starring role. On Broadway in a show called <laughs> See the Jaguar. Sadly, the show lasted three nights before closing as it was considered an absolute flop. Oh no, oh no. Not a great start. <laughs> no. Um, James played the character Wally Wilkins, and here is the synopsis for the show. In a remote section of the West, Brad owns the sole gas station and store. He also owns a small zoo where he cages the occasional wild cat or whatever wildlife can be caught in the area. The cages are Brad's obsession. They remind him of man's supremacy over nature. They remind him that he is a master in this village where everybody is in debt to him. But he is not oh. master over his daughter Jana, who has fallen in love with Brad's outspoken enemy, Dave Ricks. 
But if Brad's weapons are force, hatred, and violence, Dave's are peace, love, and gentleness, the two men battle over Wally Wilkins, an, in an innocent boy of 17 who was hidden away by his demented mother and who is now free since his mother died. Because the boy is supposedly in possession of a large sum of money, Brad pursues Wally, whom Dave and Jana are escorting to safety. When Brad catches up with them, he realizes that his pursuit of Wally has alienated him from his daughter. At the end of a night of wild drunkenness, Brad imprisons Wally in a cage to free Wally and Jana from her father's dominance and to affirm the deeper strength of the gentle over the violent. Dave gives up his life. Why does, okay, this, 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 why does it give me Tiger King vibes? I, like this, <laughs> this, this feels like OG Broadway's version of Tiger King. I'm like, how is this just one Broadway show? I'm like, this is a whole fucking movie. <laughs> this is what I mean. You've got like exotic animals. You've got power hungry, crazy people. Like you've got like the, the peace loving hippies that do questionable things. Like I. It, there's there's just so much there's so much there's a lot going on in this one play and i'm like and how the heck in the 1950s are you doing all of this on a stage without That's it hilarious. looking just like pure chaos like it's just like so many actors dressed as animals like just all of them cages everywhere like <laughs> yeah so like it's a super weird concept Mm -hmm. But it is a show from 1952, and all the shows that I've seen from that time are pretty odd when we look at them from a modern perspective. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen like a night, like early 1950s musical that or play that I'm like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> unless it's like a remake of like a classic novel or something. Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah, <laughs> yeah. So to make this part short, I will recognize that James did some more work on Broadway and some smaller roles on television before he landed his break, his big break in the first of the movies that most of us all know him from. 1953. Elia Kazan was on the search for the perfect actor to play Cal Trask, an emotionally difficult role in the film adaptation of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Kazan wanted a quote-unquote Brando as his leading man, so the screenwriter suggested James. When James and the director met, Kazan is said to have disliked James because of how moody and complex he was, but admitted that James was perfect for the role and cast him. Uh, well, so basically, I don't like this guy personally, but he does fit, though, so... Yeah. Like, personally, I don't like him, but his mm -hmm. moody and complex, his moodiness and complexities are perfect Super for this character. character, therefore we'll take him. <laughs> Yep. And he is good looking enough that he was considered like to be like a Marlon Brando of his day, like of the like of the 50s. So, sounds like Hollywood. So, James hopped on a plane to leave from New York for Los Angeles on April 8th, 1954, and history officially started to be made. So, with James Dean on set, nothing in the script was safe. <laughs> this is oh, what so. I love about James's acting style as he would ad-lib almost every single scene he was in. Yes, I love actors that do that and do it well. Like, I knew that he improvised most of, like, my favorite of his films, but I mm -hmm. wasn't aware that he was doing it for his first major film as well. My word, that's Like, disgusting. you would have thought that it was like, okay, my very first major film, I'll make sure I make a good impression. Mm-hmm. But no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so, one scene, for example, is one when where his character's father refuses a gift of $5,000 that the character got by speculating in beans before the states entered World War I. For the non-business slash Wall Street folks like I am, speculating in beans basically means that he bet on the fact that the price of beans would rise and make money off of it, which so, actually like happened before World War I. That people would basically bet, I think it was beans and corn, as to like the pricing of it and how much it would raise, etc. Knowing gotcha. that a war was like on the horizon. See, you said all that, and my brain just immediately went. So, like a modern, realistic Wall Street version of Jack and the Beanstalk. Then. <laughs> sure. You got rich because beans. <laughs> yeah. So the script called for the character to run away from his father in this scene. But James right. decided to take a different approach. He turns to run away, 
but then turns back and lunges at the actor playing the father, grabbing him into a full-on hug while bursting into hysterical crying. What? Can you imagine being the other actor, knowing that this isn't in the script, and just being there so confused? Like, so, Massey's reaction was of genuine shock, and so the yeah. improvised scene was kept in the final cut. Because... <laughs> They, like Massey's reaction was just so perfect and real. They were like, "Well, that wasn't what we planned on, but it was uh, like it it was amazing. So we'll keep it. <laughs> Don't oh, even need man. to retake it. Done. Thank you." I mean, if it works, it works. So after East of Eden, James was quickly cast in Rebel Without a Cause, a role that was very similar to the character of Cal, with the amount of angst needed to pull it off. I just understood the Hillary Duff line. Yeah. Yeah, I get it now. <laughs> Rebel is probably the most well-known of his movies, as it was extremely popular with the teenagers of the time, and has become a cult classic in our more modern-day society. It's another film based off of a book. This time, one that was written by a psychiatrist called Rebel Without a Cause, The Hypnoanalysis of a Criminal Psychopath from 1944. Oh, well, I mean, of all the books to make movies off of, I feel like that would be an interesting one, so... So it is interesting um, that this is considered an inspiration for the film, when, by the end of pre-production, the only thing in common between the two works is the title. Oh, no! (laughs) They stopped claiming that it was an adaptation of the novel at that point, right? Because, like, it's fine as an individual movie that's, like, taking its inspiration from it. They didn't still say that it was an adaptation then, though, right? I oh, think you're making they did. It tells me that I'm not right. <laughs> I think that they did still. Yeah. Listen, 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 listen. I don't know who's listening to us right now, but if anyone who's listening to us right now is a movie producer and you're planning on making a film that's an adaptation of a novel, if they get to be too different, that's fine. But stop calling it an adaptation. You mean Annihilation? Yeah, Annihilation is more accurate. (laughs) No, Annihilation the movie. It's based off of a book, but it is like, it has left out the most important parts of the book and added in a pile of stuff that's not in the book that I'm like, this isn't the book at all. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It just, it bothers me. They can be two individual things. You can be inspired by something and make a completely new work. Stop, like, copying, it's, like... Well, I mean, they already have, they had already bought the rights to the book, so you may as well still, like, use it to your advantage. (sighs) It bothers me. It bothers me so much. It bothers me so much. So, this is the only film of James Dean's where he was actually one of the top-billed actors, along with his two co-stars, Sal Mino and Natalie Wood. And I'm about to break your brain. Okay. All three top-billed actors would pass away tragically young. What? Like, how, like, the same, like, how old? So, Mino was murdered in 1979 at the age of 37, and Natalie Mm -hmm. Wood drowned under mysterious circumstances in 1981 at the age of 43. Okay. Yeah. So lucky crew. The film, I would say that the film itself possibly cursed. Um, <laughs> or at least the top billed actors were all kind of cursed. But yeah. And all under mysterious circumstances. That's... Only Natalie is really a mysterious circumstance. We know all the details behind James Dean and we know all the details behind Salminos. But Natalie's is the only one that it's like, was she murdered or was it a tragic accident? Who knows? Okay, no okay. one's coming forward with the truth. Fair enough. So maybe unusual circumstances is yeah. a better descriptor. Yeah. All right. So the behind the scenes of filming Rebel really showed the insanity of this age of Hollywood. <laughs> Natalie Wood almost didn't get the role as the director wasn't convinced that she could portray a wild teenager. On a night out with okay. friends, Wood found herself in a car accident where the director rushed to the hospital to see her. It said that while she was feeling the effects of the pain meds, she heard the doctor muttering that she was a goddamn juvenile delinquent. So she called out to the director, asking him if he heard what the doctor said and if she could have the role now, please. (laughs) And she got the role. That was super unprofessional on the doctor's part, but, like, that's hilarious. (laughs) 
And it's like, basically like, you don't think I can portray a wild teenager? Well, look, I portrayed a wild teenager. I literally am one, so... Yeah. The studio also had some interesting choices for this film. It was first mm -hmm. filmed in black and white, as Warner Brothers didn't think it would be popular, and they didn't want to spend the money on color film for a B movie. Oh, that's funny. When they realized that James was becoming a hot, rising star... They changed their minds and switched to filming it in color. Many scenes had to be refilmed for the color stock, which ultimately kind of cost them more money than what they had tried to save. Oh, that's such a nightmare. That would be so obnoxious. All the takes that you'd have to redo just because some producer <laughs> didn't. I just... I am so glad that it's so much easier to switch between color and black and white now. Right. <laughs> Maybe not on, like, a movie production level, but, like, for the everyman. Right. Okay. So if the production had kept this film as it was originally scripted, it would have mm -hmm. been an even bigger cultural shift than it was. Originally, so. Sal Mino's character was meant to be gay. Warning to our listeners, there are some spoilers ahead. If you haven't watched the film, other than you, Kat, I recommend yes. pausing the podcast and giving it a watch before coming back to listen to the rest if you're against spoilers. It really is worth the watch, even though it may seem confusing to a more modern audience. Yeah, I don't get the option of pausing and coming back. I'm, I'm, I'm just no. here. I'm here to ride this out. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so Mino's character, Plato very obviously had the hots for James's character, Jim. Mino later said in interviews that it wasn't surprising to him that Plato would be killed in the movie as he was, as he was meant to be the first gay teenager in a film during a time that LGBTQ plus rights were barely existent. Aww. James Dean in real life was not so secretly bisexual, which would have likely caused him problems in his career if he had lived long enough to have more experience in the film industry. In the final cut of the film, it is obvious that Jim is torn between Judy and Plato for his affections, even though it's not said outright. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, like, super cute how Plato is just so enamored with Jim and, like, as characters in this movie. Like, it is so obvious Aww. that... <laughs> If you didn't kind of already kind of, like know and have like suspicions of a LGBTQ plus like relationship happening between them, it just kind of looks like a little kid trying to like be cool with like a big brother kind of character, right? But like, but with knowing that it was originally meant to be that, or it, and even just like n now in like more modern day, like knowing about LGBTQ plus relationships like you can kind of like you can definitely see it more how they're more mainstream and we talk about them more yeah, yeah. and so first so it's like it's easier to spot it but like when i first saw rebel without a cause i was like oh it's like a little brother trying to be cool like his big brother kind of idea of like a friendship and then as i yeah. kind of got a bit more educated about the lgbtq community i kind of started seeing it more i'm like oh no like he's in love with this guy <laughs> but can't when say anything yeah, once you break through that heteronormative like yeah. mindset, it's like, oh, this opens up a whole host of other options. <laughs> exactly. And then knowing James's bisexuality and like how the character of Jim is just so torn between the two of them is super cool and like mm -hmm. amazingly well done acting. Hmm. So at the time of filming for Rebel, James was actually already cast in his third movie called Giant. The scheduling made it impossible for them for him to do both, so they almost went another way for Rebel. Thankfully, Elizabeth Taylor got pregnant, and so the filming for Giant was pushed for her to be able to have the baby. Well, that's a coincidence that works out a little too well. Right? If James <laughs> wasn't playing Jim, Rebel would have been an extremely different movie for the exact same reason that East of Eden was done so well. Most of Rebel is James doing improv. <laughs> it is clear from the very first scene of Rebel that James knows this character the best as he lays in the middle of the road playing with a toy monkey amongst fast food wrappers littered on the road. Unofficially, the movie had two directors as Nicholas Ray encouraged James's artistic visions, allowing him to direct his castmates towards the tone that he felt would be best for each scene that he was part of. That's wild. It's 
so cool because it actually like really set that tone for the mm-hmm. movie that I'm like I'm so curious as to what it would have looked like if it wasn't James but it would have been a totally different film yeah and the level of trust like he's like I, I knew like relatively new like young actor at this point the level of trust that the director had in him like maybe he was willing to take more of a risk because they assumed it was going to be like a b-roll like type movie but like well I think the level of trust to just like set the stage yeah the like before filming um james and nicholas ray they had like meetings and stuff about the movie mm-hmm. and from like the very start of filming i think james's ad-libbing and stuff and ray was like oh like this is good this is good like this kid knows what he's doing and stuff like that right like let's keep mm-hmm. rolling with it because this is working yeah, he's got a head for this, clearly, so let's use that. Yeah. Um, it also meant that James got injured quite a bit as he wanted to do all of his own stunts as much as possible in order to ensure that he was fully in character for the entirety of the film shoot. That's intense. An example is this one iconic scene where the character of Jim is drunk in the police station and starts pounding on the police officer's desk. Rumors about the set claim that James showed up for the scene actually drunk and pounded on the desk himself, breaking multiple bones in his hand, which meant that they had to shoot around his bandages. Okay, listen, listen. Okay, method acting is a thing. This has crossed the line from method acting into just something else entirely like that. But when you see the film, like, you're going to see how well this method acting did for this film because like this is like a, a one of the most iconic film scenes ever is but this whole police cost? station thing but at what cost though there was also a fight scene where they used real blades and production oh stills show james placing padding under his shirt on one take one of the other actors accidentally sliced james in the arm When the director Mm -hmm. called Cut, worried that his star was badly injured, James was reportedly absolutely pissed and screamed at him to never say Cut in a scene to James, that James would be the one to call Cut if something was wrong. Okay, that's a little much. That's, that's, that's a little much. I don't know. Like, they, the dedication to your craft and to making it perfect and to doing it well is one thing but when it comes at the cost of your health and safety or someone else's health and safety it's too far yeah so dennis hopper one of the co-stars in rebel has Mm -hmm. said that james was so upset that he couldn't preserve the realism of the cut that he walked off set and it took quite a while to calm him down enough to continue the shoot because like all he wanted was because because of like how he got cut and stuff right he wanted that real reaction from his character because it's like yeah we're play fighting with these weapons like it's and stuff right so because he had that perfect opportunity to actually have a real reaction he was like i can't deal with this right now i need to go fucking lose my shit in my trailer i'll come back when i'm ready well i'm glad that he lost his shit in his trailer and not just at all the people around him no, he did, he did, like, know, like, when he needed to, like, first he was like, I'm gonna get angry at this director who is super keen about my needs as an actor. Health and safety. (laughs) But I think James was like, no, like, you gotta trust that I know that it wasn't bad enough cut. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Like, I I can kind of, like, I see both sides of it, but I'm like, just knowing James. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know, that gets... That gets concerning pretty... That gets concerning pretty fast. Yeah. All right. So, during the filming of both Rebel and Giant, both taking place um, during 1955, James was majorly obsessed with racing cars. It wasn't as much of an issue during Rebel as it was during Giant for the team behind the films. The production team for Giant had literally put a racing ban on James as they were worried that his racing habit would cause major injury and delay the shoot. Honestly, fair. (laughs) Yeah. That's honestly a valid concern. As soon as Giant finished shooting, James entered a race that was scheduled for October 1st to 2nd, 1955. 
He had just upgraded his car to a brand new Porsche 550 Spider. For reference, Spiders were designed especially for racing and are now worth a lot of money. For example, a 1958 Spider sold for over five million dollars in 2018. Porsche, Porsche, why you gotta be like that? Only about 90 of these cars were made and sold in 1955. See, this is a problem with Porsches, is that they're freaking gorgeous cars, but, like, they're so unattainable. <laughs> they're gorgeous cars, but then we also have to remember that with, like, these earlier models, mm -hmm. seat belts and stuff like that were not a necessity in a car. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. That so, is... they're gorgeous, they're just not the most safe. Well, at that point. Yeah. We should clarify. Yeah, at this point. <laughs> For legal reasons, historically speaking. <laughs> modern Porsches, I'm sure, are very, very safe. Don't come at us. <laughs> Depending on how you drive them. Well, yes, but like the, <laughs> the car itself is designed to be safe. All right. So James headed out on the road to the race on September 30th, 1955. His original plan was to trailer the spider to the race, accompanied by his mechanic, Rolf Wutherich, stunt coordinator Bill Hickman, and magazine photographer Sanford Roth. Weatherich suggested to James that the spider should actually be driven to the race site as it was newly put together with their racing optimization changes, um, so the engine and other parts kind of needed to be broken in before you put it out on a racetrack. James agreed, um, and they left Hickman and Roth to travel behind himself and Weatherich uh, with the trailer. So you had two people in the trailer, two people in the spider. Mm -hmm. The group made a few stops, and by 3.30 p.m. that day, both vehicles were stopped and ticketed for speeding. James was going 10 miles per an hour over the speed limit, while Hickman and Roth were going 20 miles per hour over the limit, as vehicles pulling trailers had a lower limit than regular passenger cars at this time. I mean... Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, after being pulled over, the group um, then stopped for refreshments and met up with some fellow racers. Um, they made plans to meet at a restaurant on the way to the site uh, for dinner later that evening. At about 5.45 p.m., James and Weatherich were far ahead of their trailer crew as they came up towards the Route 46 junction heading west. Coming eastbound was another vehicle, this one a 1950 Ford Custom Coupe. The driver, a 23-year-old Cal Poly student and Navy veteran named Cal Turnipseed, literally spelled T-U-R-N-U-P-S-E-E-D. Is that his legal name? Yes. Uh, how, why, why, why did someone at some point go oh what's that the government wants us to have last names turnip seed why <laughs> and it's not even like the vegetable turnip it's like turn up seed okay but it could have been the vegetable turnip and then just like misspelled or respelled over the years they change and adapt a little bit right like who knows but like that implies that someone at some point was like you know what i want my last name to be turnip seed like that you sound like a fairy like i uh... <laughs> Well, there is every now and then we come across a last name and I'm like how 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 did this like why it's okay I misread it at first to be turn up speed and I was like oh geez that's <laughs> ominous um <laughs> and uh, then I'm like no wait there's no oh, p man. there's no p we're just missing the one letter <laughs> oh my word that's hilarious okay so turn up seed suddenly mm. turned directly in front of the spider in order to take the exit onto Route 41 at the junction. As Turnip Seed was crossing the center line, he hesitated, mm. pumping the brakes multiple times without really stopping any momentum. Oh no. For an outside driver, this would look very confusing as you try to figure out if the car is going to stop or not. Yeah. Because, like, you're still seeing the lights. Mm-hmm. James could see the impending crash, 
and attempted to use some of his racing moves to avoid it by power steering the spider into a sidestepping slide that would hopefully avoid or at least minimize the impact. Right. He was driving just over the speed limit, and findings after the crash show that he was braking extremely hard in an attempt to avoid the surprise turn by turnip seed. Unfortunately, both cars were going too fast, and there wasn't enough time or space between them for their move for this move to work. The oh, no. vehicles collided fully head on causing the lightweight spider to fly into the air and spin before landing on all four wheels in a northwest gully. Wetherich was thrown from the spider while James was absolutely trapped in the wreckage. He was cut out from the mangled car and both occupants were rushed to the nearest hospital. James was pronounced dead upon arrival at 6.20 p.m. with more than one fatal injury including a broken neck. A nurse who was at the scene thought that, like at the scene of the accident, thought that she might have felt a weak pulse, but others say that he had died instantly. Mm. Turnip Seed and his passenger walked away with minimal injuries and were found innocent of any criminal acts at an inquiry held just three days after the incident. A because police officer. Mechanical failure isn't their fault, right? Because it was the brakes. No. No. So the. Inquiry, the judge didn't really care to find out the facts about what happened. So, somebody, so turn up seat and stuff said that, and like other, like some people said that James was going like super uh, far um, over the um, speed limit. The speed limit. And that it was James's fault that this accident happened. Other people who saw the accident, including one of the officers who was at the scene, so this officer who was at the scene came out in 2005 saying that the judgment was wrong due to what the accident site evidence showed. That James actually was doing the best he could and was pretty much going the speed limit. James was only 24 years old. And they just they just blamed it on him because they assumed that he was speeding. He was on his way to a that race. That was an easier story. Yeah, he was on his way to a car race, so he had to have been speeding. He was known to have, like, to be, like, a super passionate young man. He was also known to be bisexual. That, so they just completely threw him under the bus. Yeah. That's disgusting. That's, normally, uh, descriptions of car accidents aren't triggering for me, but for some reason today it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, uh, yeah, that, that story hits a little close to home. That is... Like that's that's just like the guy is already dead. You're also gonna throw the blame of the accident on him. Like, mm-hmm. like it's a scary situation. Like especially with like those kind of crashes, they can get so bad so fast. Um, yeah. Like I, I'm just I'm very very grateful that cars today are designed to be so much safer and have so much more regard for uh, passenger safety than they used to. Yeah. Um. It's a much safer situation once you're in a car accident now, but like y'all be careful out there. Mm-hmm. Be careful out there. I've seen too much. Just, just be careful about. Just yeah, just be careful. Yeah. So after the accident, Weather Rich's health went downhill as he spiraled into depression, suicidal tendencies, and became an alcoholic from the trauma that he suffered in the accident. Doubt. Fans of James Dean blamed him for the accident as there were rumors that Wetherich was actually the one driving at the time of the accident. They found James Dean in the car. What do you mean? How? So the way that James was found in the car, he was kind of side, like kind of like diagonal. So they weren't sure if he was in the driver's seat or the passenger seat. Some people were saying that when they left their last stop before this accident, that it was actually mm-hmm. Wutherich who had gotten in the driver's seat. Okay, that's messed up. So That's messed up. Just because you're a fan of James Dean doesn't mean you get to blame his actual friend for his death because no. you don't want James to be at fault. That's messed up. Well, these fans made his mental health much worse as they yeah. sent threatening letters constantly. It's kind of okay. like what we see now with social <sighs> media, but Wait, with snail okay. mail this time. 
like okay you don't get to call yourself a fan if you're gonna threaten people in their name you're not a fan anymore you're you're in, like you're obsessed that's there's you're not you're not just a fan you're not just a supporter there is something wrong with you mentally if you're that obsessed that you're sending death threats to people don't do that yeah whether it's married four times after the accident ultimately mm. stabbing his last wife in her sleep after one of his suicide his attempts at suicide <sighs> he was convicted of attempted manslaughter because he didn't actually kill the wife thankfully and Good. sent to a mental institution rather than a prison which i agree with like he Fair. clearly had issues once he was released from the institute he worked for a variety of large car racing companies uh, as a mechanic until july 22nd 1981 when he crashed his honda civic into a barrier while driving under the influence he was cut mm. out of the wreckage and pronounced dead at the scene at 53 years old oh my goodness which is like super sad that he basically passed away the same way he would have possibly passed away in 1955 if he hadn't been thrown out of the car yeah yeah it's like it was coming for him anyway it was just a matter of when holy yeah. so james dean has been an iconic influence ever since his career and tragic death many of today's greatest actors have been inspired to begin acting after they saw a james dean film this includes martin sheen nicholas cage robert de niro leonardo dicaprio and johnny depp wow those but, are some big names right both Rebel Without a Cause and Giant were released after his death, while he was also awarded two Best Actor Academy Awards, being the first to receive a, nom a nomination posthumously for an acting award from the Academy. Wow, I really, like, I really wonder, like, where his career would have gone if he had stayed alive. Looks aside, we've discussed yeah. that, but, like, I, I really wonder where the rest of his career would have ended up. Exactly. In 2019, James Dean was announced to be cast in a new movie. Oh. Wait. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, the on. look on your face there is just priceless. I got distracted by the fluff for one second, and I came back to hearing in 2019 he was cast in a new movie. Uh, how? With, like, the CGI thing that they did? So with, like... two directors obtained the rights from the James Dean estate to use his likeness and voice, as well as using a voice actor, in CGI for an action drama film called Finding Jack. I, it, uh, uh, um, <laughs> um, um, is this, res is, uh, this feels disrespectful to the dead to, like, take, especially someone like James Dean, where kind of his whole thing was, I do it my way, to then take his likeness and make him do it your way feels wrong. Well, according to them, he was, like, the only actor they could think of to fit this role that they wanted him in. No living actor was good enough for them, nope. I guess. What on earth? Are you serious? There are, like, please. So, current Humanity, actors... why are you like this? <laughs> current actors and movie fans alike shared their major concerns over this. Yeah. And the film was ultimately cancelled. Good. So rather what? than just finding somebody else to play the role, they just scrapped the whole thing. What kind of, like, ludicrous suggestion even was... How did that, like, get to, like... How did that even get that far? Like, I don't understand who... Why? Who thought that was a good idea? I mean, in a way, when I found out this news, like, I, like, I found out pretty quickly. Like, as soon as it was leaked, I was like, wait, what? Um, in a way, I was like, yeah, no, no, thank you. But then I also was like, I'm curious as to what they would do and how this would actually work. Like, I'm curious about the technology of it and how it would actually work. But I was like, no, please, no, especially not with my James, not with my Jimmy. Like, this is what I mean. Like, it's you. OK, we have AI generators that can make up a face like they don't need a pre-existing face they scan a whole bunch of faces and they make one up they make up faces of people that don't exist use that don't use an actual person who's who's already passed away like or use someone who's living use a living person someone who's still alive and then use images of them when they were younger you can do that that's fine but don't be using like people who have already died like decades ago now at this point and like just 
of everything that I know about James Dean, everything in me says that he would not want that. Like, nope. <laughs> that does not seem like something he'd be into at all. <laughs> yeah. All right. Why would he? <sighs> to wrap up this part of the episode, I want mm-hmm. to talk briefly about the Portia spider itself. Okay. Lovingly nicknamed the Little Bastard, <laughs> this car has gone down in history on its own. Yeah. From the moment James had bought it, people around him found the car to be extremely eerie. A week before the crash, James met up with another actor, Alec Guinness, who reportedly pleaded with him not to get in the car or he'd find himself dead by that time next week. Guinness just had like a really bad gut feeling about it and later wrote, that he found the car to be sinister and affected his mood the entire time he was in the same room as it. Okay, but did he die within a week of... Yes. Actually? Yes. That's how every conspiracy... Like, listen, listen, I'm a cynic, but every conspiracy theorist, like, little tiny pieces of my brain are, like, trying to form a single brain cell right now and, like, understand how that happened. Like... There's more. Oh, no. (laughs) After the crash, the spider was sold from a wreckage yard, and the racing driver that bought it stripped it for parts. He put the engine in his own racing car and loaned the transmission and suspension to another driver. Both drivers crashed their cars during the same race soon after, with the original... I I... (laughs) I get the haunted car thing now. I get it. Yeah. (laughs) That's why. That that makes sense. You know what? I buy it. (laughs) Um, So the original purchaser survived, and Uh the driver who borrowed parts died on the scene. So that's two confirmed kills by this car. So I I jokingly mentioned the Supernatural episode as being something I knew about James Dean earlier, but literally that was in it, and I thought they made it up because I was like, that's too, like, out there. There's no way. Nope. That actually happened? Yes. So the next owner of the spider ended up being a publicity monger who called himself the King of Customs, with customs spelt with a K. What? (laughs) He bragged that he would rebuild the car, but the frame was way too damaged. Not deterred, he used the car's fame and loaned it out to a local council so it could tour around to car shows, movie theaters, and even bowling alleys. That that car is too damaged to be street legal though, so they're just like carting this thing around. Yes. Like, I, so it's kind of like with Bonnie okay. and Clyde's car, how it constantly got carted around, even like on the day of the murders inside of it. Which is freaking insane. Um, yeah. So and supposedly, like even after like their death, it went to like the casinos and different places, and then so there's the original car. And then there's also a remake of the car, like a reconstruction of it with the bullet holes, like put, like placed just so oh, as well. So that we, nobody knows now which car is the le- the actual car. Oh my gosh. Actually, wait. Yeah. They lost track of which one was the original car. Yeah. Guys. <laughs> Guys. Because the car got, like went missing and then they, so then they fabricated a new car and then. And then the other car suddenly showed up, and now nobody knows which one's which. Um. How does a car? How does a car go missing? How does a car Ooh. suddenly reappear? Um, I don't understand. We're about to get with that with the spider too. Oh. Okay, but first, <laughs> while on this tour, the spider suddenly caught fire while inside of a storage unit with other cars. The spider had uh, very little damage from the blaze that, that it was under, and none of the other cars got burnt at all. But, like, apparently, like, for the people who actually went into the hangar, like, it was a good blaze. And, like, no damage, basically, to this car that was, like, fully even, in like, massive flames. Not even, like, the paint? Like... I think very little of the paint and two tires got a little singed. How? What? And none of the other cars that it was, that were around it, like, were touched at all. Just the spider. No, I'm fully on board with this theory. The spider's haunted. It's just, it's haunted. It's either, it's haunted or it's possessed. Um, two wheels had also been removed and sold. Oh, for, please. The two so wheels. as a distraction? The two wheels suddenly blew out at the exact 
same time causing their new owner to veer off the road what only the two wheels on this car that were from the spider blew and they blew at the exact same time well okay that one actually makes a little bit more sense because you're supposed to change your tires all at the same time so they're evenly worn so if one of them goes it makes sense that the other one would go the exact same time is a little wild just but it's not impossible because they're both used tires from the same car it's not impossible but like unlikely that it's exact the exact same time yeah so there's other non-confirmed stories about other incidents that this car has caused including (laughs) some broken hips and a few more deaths including like that the car just suddenly like it was fully in park and it just suddenly started rolling off of the trailer that it was on crushing somebody to death and stuff like that but like none of those have been like fully confirmed that yes these happen with the spider but like there's a lot of other rumors about what the spider has done but what what we do know is that all of a sudden the car suddenly just disappeared how 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 in 2005 there was a million dollar reward put out to find the little bastard but it never showed up Until now. What? In May of 2021, the car suddenly made an appearance again after one of the car parts was found hidden in a wooden crate away from view for over 30 years. What? The trans axle assembly was put up for auction ending May 29th, 2021. Would you like to guess how much in Canadian dollars trans axle assembly sold for millions millions it sold for nearly half a million dollars half a million okay i actually overshot that (laughs) yeah um and it came with a letter from porsche themselves verifying that it came from james (gasps) dean's car because they try is like the like the number like the actual number tracked as to what they found as to what their records showed um because there's like only one of 90 of these spiders right so yeah. they had all of the records and they could pinpoint that, yes, this trans axle assembly came from that exact car. And so because of that, they were able to find the car or we just they have, had the So one the piece actual of car it itself is still kind of missing, but we well, do at least one piece of it. We do have at least one piece of it that is just suddenly okay, magically appeared, but we still have no idea where the actual car is. Oh, my word. That, ha- like, listen, like. I, I understand cars get stolen. I get that. But that car seems like a difficult job to pull off. Like, how? D- I'm just hoping that this buyer how? doesn't try to put this um, car part into an actual car. Not because it, I don't think that's it. a good idea. A, yeah. Listen, listen. Put it in a garage that is detached from your house just in case. Give some space. I don't know what's going to happen. A tornado, a fire, or a hurricane. I don't know. But something is out to destroy this freaking car. Do not put it in your home. Do not put it in your car. Do not put your health and safety at risk. Yeah. Yikes. So yeah, that is the chaotic life of James Dean. (laughs) Both before, during, and after life. (laughs) Yeah, wow. Yikes. All right. Should I tell you what you already know about Audrey Hepburn? Okay. (laughs) I'm excited for this. I'm kind of interested to see in like what you pick up on as like a, oh I already knew that or like oh maybe I didn't know that or like a cat how did you not know that <laughs> or me just being like and also this and also this yeah. don't forget this exactly. part cat <laughs> um actually cat your research is shit and I already know way better uh, in all of it <laughs> <laughs> that's my nightmare <laughs> all right okay so I'm not even going to ask what you know about Audrey Hepburn because we've established uh, more than me. <laughs> I was going to say, do you want me to me... do your part for you? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you mean, What is your briefest summary of Audrey Hepburn? World War II hero. <laughs> amazingly classy woman. Mm-hmm. And major philanthropist while also being a damn good actress and singer. Yeah, and pretty much. She's in one of my favorite movies. With one of my other favorite actors, Fred Astaire. Which which one is that? Funny face. Oh, funny face, nice. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to remember which one Fred Astaire was in. I think we right. might have done two together, possibly, but for sure they did funny face together. I will say I did. 
like I mentioned her career, I talk about her career, but I talk more so about the rest of her life because um, of the attitude that she sort of had towards her career, where I'll get into it a little bit more later. She kind of thought like, oh, I'm just, you know, limit, like this is just my life. It's nothing special. So, which is an interesting take from one of the golden girls of Hollywood. So like, it's a, uh, yeah, she's an interesting person with an interesting perspective. So I wanted to focus on the rest of her life. <laughs> Yeah, she was super humble about her career. Oh, so much so. Uh, very, very humble, very, very down-to-earth person. All right. So, born in May 1929 in Brussels, Belgium, as Audrey Kathleen Rustin. Audrey was born to Baroness Ella Van Heemstra and a businessman named Joseph Victor Anthony Rustin. Joseph was an honorary British consul in the Dutch East Indies, and so he had some status as well. Both had married and divorced before marrying each other, so Audrey grew up with half-siblings. Uh, the first three, three years of her life were spent traveling a lot, as her father's job took him back and forth between three different countries, and the family followed him each time he had to manage another branch of the loan company that he worked for. They settled a little bit in Brussels in 1932. She lived a sheltered and privileged life at the start, but that's not to say it was perfect. Her parents were both members of the British Union of Fascists actively recruiting for them, touring with them, and collecting funds for them. They were Nazi sympathizers, is basically what that means, right before World War II. So there's that. Yeah, it always, like, knowing what she did during World War II, and I'm like, interesting that you went for this way, while well, your parents went that way. <laughs> yeah, and there's very much, like, there's good reason for it. it I, I think it makes sense. We'll dig into that in just a minute here. But yeah, at age six, her father left the family, and though her parents wouldn't be officially divorced for another three years, he uh, like completely abandoned her during this time. Audrey later would speak about this period and how deeply traumatic it was for her to have been abandoned by him and to have just been like left behind and discarded. All she wanted was for him to love her, and he just didn't. Uh, her mother sent her half-brothers to live with relatives and took Audrey with her to her family's estate in Arnhem. Uh, Baroness Alla met Adolf Hitler around this time in 1935 and wrote a passionate article about the event in the British fascist magazine, The Black Shirt. Uh, Ella referred to Hitler saying he had a most charming personality and said he should be proud of the rebirth of this great country. This is still before World War II had begun, but after Hitler was passing anti-Semitic laws. Yep. So, yeah, this part gets lost over a lot with Audrey Hepburn. And, like, listen, I, of all people, know very well that we don't judge people by their parents. But you can't pretend that it didn't happen. I understand what she did. We'll talk about that later. I get it. But now talking about it, like, it is it is a part of history. And oh, yeah. It, sh it should be acknowledged. But this is not a judgment on Audrey nearly as much as it is a judgment on her parents who were kind of awful in other ways as well. With her dad abandoning her and her mother being so harsh and stern, she did not have she did not have a lot of luck in the parent department. No. So this is a point of sympathy towards Audrey uh, for me and the judgment towards her parents pretty much. Yeah, no, for sure. Her like her mom did have a very key part in Audrey's like future career as well during this time. Yeah, because isn't her her mom who sent who got her into ballet lessons? Uh, her father actually in 1937 decided that she should be educated in England. Uh, and sent her to Kent. Uh, to be educated at a small independent school, and that's where she began taking the ballet lessons. Right, right. So technically, it was him. She continued them later, and she provided yeah. opportunities for her to continue doing it later. But at that point, Audrey was already obsessed with ballet. Yeah. Uh, she loved it. It was everything she wanted to do. Like, I'm not going to say her mom didn't have a role. Her mom had a closer role with her than her father did. But that's not to say it was necessarily a particularly healthy one either. Oh, God, no. <laughs> God, no. But, but, I, like, but I, like, really I know that like, somebody, <laughs> at, le like, at least, like, one or both of them like really helped her like push and like so like that became like a huge part for her career later on where it's like okay so mm -hmm. at least it did one thing right yeah they put her in ballet so that's that's the thing <laughs> that's it so like um 90 <clears throat> horrible 10 percent 
yeah did a good thing well well, and they put her in ballet, but they put her in ballet kind of at the cost of her having any kind of connection with her parents because she was separated from her mother by this. Her father had completely abandoned her. He had no interest in her, and now his mom couldn't see her. They both had every right to go and see her, and neither of them did. Like, she was completely no, abandoned no, they're horrible by them. Parents. So ballet was the only thing that, they, that she had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah, then a year later, her parents would be officially divorced. Her father... Like, yeah, we've touched on this. Her father never visited her, and Audrey was, like, completely alone. Besides just, like, her peers and her teachers. But, like, she had to, like, be there and, like, watch as other kids went home to their parents on the weekend or for holiday. And she didn't get to have that. Like, how, like, traumatic for a little kid. Like, mm-hmm. people, man. <laughs> but in 1939, so she she wasn't there for too, too long. It was only a couple of years, but still. But in 1939, her mother made a mistake that would cost them both dearly. Britain declared war on Germany, and Audrey's mother thought that moving her to the Netherlands would keep them safe, as it had managed to stay neutral during World War I. Ashley's already shaking her head. Anyone who knows anything about history knows that this was very incorrect. Very. Audrey managed... Very, very. Audrey managed to continue studying and excelled as a ballerina, but it was less than a year before the Germans would invade, and that was no more. Her mother being a Nazi didn't save her family from hardship, nor did her status. Uh, Audrey's name was changed to Ada Van Hem Heemstra in order to avoid suspicion that she was actually a British child, because that would not have gone over well in uh, German-occupied areas. Wouldn't have been great. No. <laughs> and But she was, like, aware that she was living as a prisoner at this point. Like, she was a child, but, like... She knew that this wasn't right. She knew it wasn't right that people, that they were living in their cellar so that they wouldn't be shot by stray bullets, that people couldn't talk about it or listen to the radio. Like, she could see what was going on around her, even as a small child, like, as, as a young kid. Like, she knew this wasn't right. It wasn't until Audrey's uncles were shot by the Nazis as the fir among the first hostages to be executed in Holland that Audrey's mother shifted her allegiance from the Nazis to the Dutch resistance. So it wasn't until it got personal Things could happen to everybody else. Audrey's mother didn't care. But as soon as it started affecting her family, now she's like, oh, maybe these are the bad guys. Yeah. Uh, the awareness is just mm, delightful. I mean, she's not that different from, like, other European aristocrats at this time. I'm not going to lie. I'm not saying that this wasn't, like, that this was just her or that this wasn't, like, but just because it's, like, common doesn't mean it's okay. I'm actually kind of curious if her mom's going to show up. Um, I got um, an advanced reader copy of a new nonfiction book coming out that's about um, the aristocrats who all supported Hitler. So I'm kind of curious Ooh. if this is going to come into that book or not when I get a chance to read it. Because I'm like, I'm super curious as to who all again? Because I think it's going to, I think there's like, because you had um, the Mitford sisters who... Mm -hmm were in there um there's like some a few other like american high societies who were like we love you yeah. and stuff right but i'm like i'm curious as to like who else they're gonna have a name in this book the mitford sisters were mentioned when i was reading up about uh audrey's mom and her affiliation with the nazis and with hitler and stuff the mitford sisters were mentioned and if i remember correctly uh, there was like a photograph or something where she was photographed with them. So I wouldn't be surprised if she does. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, she didn't care until it got personal. Um, Audrey, on the other hand, was watching all the things happen and was like acutely aware that this was like not right. Uh, she was watching other little kids be shipped off on tr on trains to um, the prisoner camps and to uh, concentration camps. And like she was just a kid watching other kids go to their death and that like that that always affected her but now with her mother's backing audrey was able to become involved with the dutch resistance i mean remember you're a kid you can only do what your parents will let you do yeah. um so uh they started asking her and not just her lots of dutch children did this uh, but she was one of them. She would carry messages back and forth for resistance members by tucking the notes into the soles of her shoes and biking the messages to their destination, um, which was uh, which was surprisingly the safest way to get the messages around. Yeah. Um, because like it's it's 
concealed in the sole of their shoe. There's lots of kids biking everywhere. You're not going to stop all of them. They're quick. They're small. They get in, they get out. They're like, they're gone. So she was one of the kids that was running around and doing this. She also found a way to work ballet into her resistance work. Um, she, Audrey said that ever since she was a child, ballet is what she loved most. And so it's not terribly surprising that she performed for the resistance, raising money and also providing escapism and entertainment to people living through the war. Uh, when the Dutch famine hit, Audrey and her family were affected as well. She was very malnourished, which when you suffer through starvation at a young age like that, it damages your growth and development physically and mentally. Uh, so she was very malnourished, which when you suffer through starvation at a young age like that, it damages your growth and development physically and mentally. And so going through a war-induced famine as a teenager kept her small and frankly physically weak. Yep. It wasn't until Holland was liberated and she had access to food again that she could start recovering and regaining strength. One, I think, because one of the things, like, for, like, in Hollywood and stuff that they kind of talked about was how thin she was and everything. Mm -hmm. And being like, oh, it's so great that you're this thin. And she's like, no, this is because of what I went through in the war. It's not a good thing that I'm this thin. I literally can't put on weight yeah, because so of that. <laughs> Her entire life, she's so petite. And, like, yeah, she, like, um, I was uh, watching a documentary about Audrey as part of my research for the script. And they have, like, voice clips uh, from various interviews with her. And in one of them, she's I'll go into it more later because it, it struck me in a really, like, like, in a really big way. Um, but she was talking about, like, all the things that she would change about herself if she could. And she said that she wished that she had more curves. And that's just not a thing she was ever able to like like it was just never gonna happen because of because this happened to her when she was young yeah okay um one thing mm -hmm. that i wanted to bring up because i'm gonna guess that you're pretty much done with her resistance time with your notes uh we've got a little bit more yeah pretty much yeah okay so when she was doing like when she was running the messages and stuff there was actually mm -hmm. a day where she um, also ended up taking some ration cards, um, and I think she actually did this a few times. And her route like, that she was taking with the ration cards included um, Anne Frank's hideout place. What? Like, confirmed? Like, we know that... Like, so, it's sure. not confirmed that she actually took, like, the ration cards to Anne Frank's, but... The route that she took a few times doing like the like, taking ration cards, like is like where Anne Frank's hiding place actually was. So it's very like so it's like very much speculated that she most likely um, at least once um, during this time delivered ration cards to Anne Frank's hiding place. Well, that is a connection. I didn't know they were in the same area. That yeah. is a connection that. I feel like I should have made <laughs> And then I think with those That's ration so cards, at one point, she actually was stopped by some Nazis, right? And they're like, well, where are you going? And stuff, right? And mm. she was like, I did not ask for this. <laughs> and, <laughs> but just was like very sweet. And because she had like everything so well hidden, kind of went through, but she actually had like a few run-ins while doing her routes that she actually had like stopped and had to t like talk her way out of situations yeah, and she was a shy kid too yeah. so like yeah just that like pile yeah her being a shy kid and then also pile on top of the fact that it's literally the nazis that like oh man, i can't imagine the terror like yeah oh man but yeah i was i was wrapping up her her dutch liberation because that was like these are the confirmed facts these are the things that we know that she did for sure there's there's a lot of other anecdotes there's a lot that uh hollywood kind of hyped up as uh as a part of her image and as a part of um like her her uh mass appeal they exaggerated a few stories oh that, yeah that they kind of blew out of proportion and stuff for sure like she was a kid she wasn't a superhero like <laughs> yeah um so I wanted to stick to the things that I could, like, confirm, confirm. Yeah. But that is a cool anecdote. Yeah. Well, no, like, so it's confirmed that, like, the house was on the route. It was just, like, yeah. did she actually get to stop there or not? But it was yeah. literally on her route. That they were so close together is, like, super interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, and also a good reminder is to, like, the overlap and, like, how nothing happens in a vacuum, you know? Like, 
just everything all, all of it is connected like we all live on this one big planet together like it's not like audrey hepburn existed and and frank existed it's like they they exist in the same world like this is the same universe the same experience that Anne frank had happened in the same place that audrey hepburn lived is yeah. just like audrey hepburn literally would ride her bike past Anne frank's yeah. hiding place and yet we tell them as two separate stories when really it's all just one story. It's like, yeah, that that aspect of history fascinates me so much. And I feel like, especially kind of when we talk about it in these episodes like this, where we're like, we're talking about this one story, it's so easy to miss. So I'm glad that you, I, like, I'm really glad that you brought it up because I love connecting everything back to each, <laughs> like everything back together. So yeah, obviously this left her like very physically like, small and it wasn't just her of course everyone was hungry and sick and that's why they needed liberation to begin with among all the billions of other reasons but when the war was over it took it took her time to recover she wanted to go back into ballet but she had to heal first and this combined with her delay in training because of the war and all this other stuff uh she ended up being years behind her peers just in technique alone they were so much more advanced than her audrey did manage to get a scholarship and went back to school in London uh, to train for ballet. But she was also later, like, trying to get back into it and realizing that her technique wasn't there. She was flat out told by her instructor that her chances of making prima ballerina were very low and that her technique was just not where it needed to be and it wasn't going to get there in time. She took this information like a real champ and moved on knowing that she was going to have to find a way to provide for herself anyway. And so she started her career. Yay! Audrey started as a chorus girl and dancing in musicals, just basically taking whatever dancing role that she could get. She started taking minor roles in movies just to make a few extra dollars in order to get by, her first minor role being in a film titled Dutch in Seven Lessons in 1948. Nice. Which is only like three years after the end of the war. Yeah. Like, I know she went like super fast. quick. <laughs> like she went so fast into mm -hmm. film. And just can like I'm just imagining like going from living in a cellar on next like next to nothing for food to suddenly like being out and performing for audiences that actually are allowed to clap at the end because they're not worried about soldiers coming in and invading. Like within like that short of a time frame feels like that would be such almost like you'd like you would be easing into it, but at the same time it feels like you'd be so almost like a shocking like switch experience yeah so yeah she was getting by but when she took a role in monte carlo baby she did a scene in hotel de paris and colette the author of Gigi, happened to be there she asked her to play Gigi on broadway and she also landed a role with william wyler in roman holiday around mm -hmm. the same time and the combination of these opportunities launched her career into stardom faster than anything she could have imagined oh yeah like i love roman holiday <laughs> like you wouldn't even be able to tell that that's like her first like major motion picture like she both her and james like when they got into their first roles like it was as if they had been doing it for years and she had no training as an actress none like, all of her training was in dance she wasn't trained as an actress at all she just she just went and did it like <laughs> mm-hmm Audrey had a look and appeal that Hollywood just hadn't seen before as well, right? She was new. She was fresh. She was elegant, and but adventurous. She was excitable, but sophisticated. She played the princess as well as the girl next door, and everyone who met her fell in love with her. She wouldn't be typecast. Like, she, like she found her niche, and she found her role, and she was eventually typecast into this role. But she wasn't, like, you know, the Marilyn Monroe sex icon, and she wasn't, like the stern kind of more mature like you know she was yeah, she, was she wasn't like a Cerise, was, yeah yeah like she was both and she was neither she was fun and she was flirty but she was young and she was bright-eyed and like absolutely freaking stunning and, and she was just she was something else entirely she was like a whole new thing um and she was just so like genuinely and authentically her because she didn't have the like training as an actress like most other hollywood starlets did rather than playing a role she was just playing herself yeah um well and like even like audrey she never like fully 
considered herself to be beautiful and even like a lot of people when they're when it's like oh yeah Audrey Hepburn's so beautiful and it's like well what makes her beautiful we can't pinpoint it but mm-hmm. she's just beautiful right when you look at like Marilyn Monroe and stuff, right you can tell like, you can list off why she's so pretty and mm-hmm. like well, a lot of actresses but with Audrey it's just like can't pinpoint it. it's just that there's something about her she's just stunning she's just stunning she's like I like I'm watching this documentary and I've like I've seen pictures of Audrey before like I knew that she was gorgeous don't get me wrong but like just the way like I don't think I'd ever seen her like really noticed her like actually in action before like I've seen pictures but videos like I hadn't really like paid much attention to so I'm sitting here watching this documentary and just the way that she moves and the way that she holds herself even when she isn't aware that someone is like has a camera on her just the way that she is is just it, like she's just beautiful <laughs> like, yeah i think like for like a more like for people who don't really know of audrey hepburn which i'm like you like even if you don't think you know of audrey hepburn you've seen a photo of audrey hepburn you've seen audrey hepburn um, i promise you've seen audrey hepburn but like, princess diana reminds me a lot of audrey with how she's not the most classically beautiful woman but there's something Mm -hmm. about her that just shines through and makes her beautiful the way that she moves the way that she talks to people and stuff like that that it's just like you're gorgeous like you don't fully Mm -hmm. know it and that's and that's what makes you that's gorgeous to me like audrey is like for me she is classically beautiful though like to me she is when i think of elegance i think of audrey hepburn yeah and and like and that's just from my first impressions of her without like diving into her like without like watching much. I realized that I watched My Fair Lady and I was like, oh wait, I know that one. I was, like all proud of myself. Hang on, you but, haven't like, watched like any of her other ones? Listen, listen. I was a very very sheltered small child. Okay. We need another movie night. We need to do a movie night that is literally us watching Rebel Without a Cause and then like the classic Audrey Hepburn movies. I know. I know. And then we will post um, about it on Instagram. We'll, we'll, like, go live on Instagram and, like, get our live reactions to it or something. That works. That would be kind of fun. I'm down for that. Especially during Rebel. <laughs> Rebel and Funny Face are, are the ones that I definitely want your live reactions for. I wish that I could get a watch party set up on Twitch because that would be a really good place to do that. But we are yes. tangenting so hard right now, so... <laughs> So yeah, so she was never trained as an actress, so her performances felt genuine and unique because she was drawing from an experience that was solely hers. And she had no idea that saying yes to role after role would send her into more and more movies. She was just trying to do her best in every role she was cast in, and she was excited, so she was saying yes to everything. She just she just had a thrill about like getting out into the world, and like then all of a sudden she was like this great big star, and she's like, how did I get here? Oh, yeah, so she was just trying to do her best in every role that she was cast in. Like, the way that she spoke about that part of it, it almost sounds like she had, like, an anxiety about it. I don't want to be diagnosing anybody, especially anybody who's not alive anymore, but, like, just the way that she talks about it reminds me very much of my own anxiety. Yeah, Uh, no, definitely. She would, right? She would show up on the first day of filming with the script completely memorized, and that sounds like exactly the kind of perfectionist bullshit I would do. (laughs) And the I complete know opposite of James anxiety. Dean. James Dean is like, script, what script? I'm just going to go for it. I know. I know. Audrey would show up and she's just been, she'd be like, yes, I've got this entire movie memorized. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm ready to go. Whatever scene. Yeah, let's do it. Whatever like, scene, whichever character. I got it. <laughs> just like all she wanted was to like hear that. Yep. That's a good cut. Thanks, Audrey. At the end of like, at the end of a scene, like that's she, like, she was living for it. And all that she wanted was to get that approval. And just like, oh my goodness, am I doing this well enough? Um, and one of the things that she said in the documentary, one of the the snippets that they had taken from previous interviews, she mentioned that she always went to uh, to see the movies that she was in, like opening night, essentially, right? Because she wanted to go into the crowd 
and see, was there anything that I could do better for next time? Was there anything that I still have to learn? And like, this is what I mean. This is exactly the type of anxious, anxious shit I would be doing. Like just sitting there analyzing myself. Like, you know what? I could have smiled wider there. You know what? I could have lifted my eyes more there. Like, that's well, I would exactly be like, the kind of stuff I would be I hiding would from the whole thing. I'd be like, I do not want to see it. I do not want to hear other people talk about it. I'm just going to go over here now and hide until the next film. Like, I, like, like, listen, like. Because I'm pretty sure that in my head, I can tell what I did wrong See, already. this is my thing. See, this is my thing. Like, as a performer on a much, 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 much smaller scale, I already do that with my freaking Twitch streams. If you think that I would be in a Golden Globe nominated movie and I wouldn't be at the first, at that first showing criticizing myself the entire time, you don't know me at all. <laughs> no, no, I can definitely see you doing it. I'd just be like, I do not want to see it. I do not want to see what I already am thinking in my head. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, because I'd want to see how it all cut together and, like, see how it ended up to see, like, yeah, like, yeah. Like, I've... I do it, I do it with the pot, like, I don't do it all the time, because I'm trying to be, like, taking care of my mental, you know, but, like, I do it with the podcast, I do it with the Twitch stream, like, I do watch back my own content, and then, like, cringe a little bit about, like, <laughs> how I could be doing so much better, but... Apparently, um, Jennifer Lawrence even does, like, the same thing, like, there's so many done. that do mm -hmm. that, where I'm like, no, no, you're perfect, like... <laughs> I watch you on the I screen, think, and I'm like, you're freaking perfect at this. You, you don't need any work. <laughs> if I remember right, it was Johnny Depp who said that he's never heard back any of the albums that he's ever recorded because he just, he refuses to do it because he knows that he's not going to like it. He's, like, more like you in that sense that he's yeah. just like, I don't need to put myself through that. I don't want to. <laughs> and I didn't get it. I didn't get it as a kid, but I get it now <laughs> because I wish I could be like that. <laughs> So it was around this time she met, oh god, this is a last name I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing, Hubert Givenchy, when he designed a dress for her in a movie called Sabrina, and they ended up becoming close friends. He designed many of her iconic gowns, and she modeled them perfectly. And she absolutely loved them. She said that she always loved pretty things, and the simple elegance of it was just everything, and it was so, so her. Um, mm -hmm. They had a real connection that, like, you don't see so often between actresses and designers in Hollywood. Yeah. And it's, it, it really showed through in the way that they worked together, in the way that his design suited her so well, mm -hmm. and in the way that she wore every single one exactly the way it needed to be. Like, that Sabrina dress is just freaking gorgeous. It's so beautiful. It's, like, like Audrey, Audrey Hepburn is, like, I didn't have the words for it at the time, but, like, high school Kate... My goal was to look like Audrey Hepburn. I didn't realize that's who I was, like, going for. But, like, when, literally for my prom dress, it I, I went for that same kind of, like, very simple, but with just, like, one piece of glitter kind of thing. Mm. Um, and I didn't realize that was a style that was kind of, like, revolutionized or, like, popularized by this iconic duo of, like, Audrey Hepburn and Givenchy. I, for a while, my dream wedding dress was literally a mix of the top half, especially the back of the Breakfast at Tiffany's black dress, and mm. then the bottom of her of the wedding dress from Funny Face. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's just... Of course, like, I've changed it's... my style by now, but... And <laughs> well, then... It's just classic. It's timeless. Mm. It's... And I also used to take pictures of Audrey all the time to hairdressers where I'm like, I want this, except do not do the bangs that short because I cannot pull <laughs> off those, like, super short bangs that somehow she pulls off. Oh, no. I honestly, you could probably chop all her hair off just like, like, um, child with a pair of scissors to a Barbie head style and she would probably still look stunning somehow. I don't understand it, but she's got such, like, a magic about her. So yeah, on the subject of the fashion and the design, she later said that the clothes that she wore in her roles were always the thing that enabled her to her, to appear confident. Like she was she was very anxious about it, but as soon as she got into that gown, she's like, "Oh yes, this is me. I am here." Right. Um, it's like her it's like her superhero cape. Like it's like the thing that she's like, "All right, I'm set. I'm good now. I got this." <laughs> oh yeah. Like it used to be like when I had skating competitions and stuff, I would be mm -hmm. a friggin' nervous wreck until i got into my dress as soon as the dress was on fine like clothing can 
actually be the be all and end all for certain oh, things. Totally. <laughs> totally. It can absolutely help with that mindset, especially when you're playing a character and when you're performing in any capacity, you're playing a character to, to an extent. The character might be you, but you're, you're playing a character to an extent. Like you are still putting yourself on show. Oh yeah. Um, I find it hard. Like I, I, I really, I'm not convinced that anybody could get up on a stage even if they are just there to portray themselves and really authentically portray themselves. Like if you're not in a casual setting, yourself isn't a hundred percent going to come through. And like that costume change, like really just cements that in your head, you know? Oh, for sure. All right. Uh, so other things about Audrey's image was that it was very carefully curated. Like we, well, like we've discussed, she had a lot of like anxious thoughts about the way that she was perceived and making people happy and stuff. Right. It makes sense that uh, she would treat her image the same way. Uh, the roles that she chose, the way that she presented herself, all aided her image as Hollywood's squeaky clean golden child. She avoided ever talking about her parents' affiliation with the Nazis. She would talk about other things like her dad leaving her and her mom being stern, but she wouldn't talk about their affiliation with the Nazis at all, likely to maintain this image and focus instead on her work with the resistance. And honestly, like... I like I really don't blame her for this like this would be like a traumatic thing to realize that the people that caused you so much trauma were like people that your parents supported well, like that would be a really hard thing to wrestle with and like during this time if she had been forthcoming about it she would be mm -hmm. more likely put into the black book Oh, Even she though she be says so as a freak, so like we got the communism book, like and stuff, right? Like she could have been canceled so fast by Hollywood, just by yeah. the fact that like in her past, her parents used to, where they're mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you now are more likely to possibly be with our just, <laughs> enemy. Which like is interesting because she absolutely was not the only celebrity with connections like this, but like, I guess. But she, but she was like so so concerned about it, and well, like, like her anxiety and everything, right? Like yeah, you're like watching like Lucy, hard. like Lucille Ball, was mm. scared to death that she was going to be canceled because uh, mm. because she had acted, she had for fun ticked the box communist or whatever on like a form. She's like the most like bold woman in the business and she's a bit afraid that she's going to be canceled basically that her entire career is going to yeah. be over so somebody like audrey with her anxiety she is going to be playing zero risks <laughs> oh, totally 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 i'm like especially since her whole image is like being this golden child like uh, you you don't play with that <laughs> no and then like, like you have what is perfect. she going to fall to back on to be nothing like what is she going to fall back on if this does like bite her in the butt. I don't think she's so worried about that actually. Well, I don't like. I don't think. She, I mean, I don't like, think she was worried about that as much as she was just worried about not being the best her that she could be, not yeah. doing the best job that she could do. Not like I like. I feel like it was so like it was less about like job security for her as it was of just like her being her best. But like it might have been though in the back of her mind because she just came from living during a war, right? So she is going to be thinking about security. How is she going to make a living to be able to support herself and have a, not even like a like a really good lifestyle like when we're thinking about like people in like Hollywood, right? But like when but like having a life that she can actually support herself to be alive and not have to go back to this right like she, what else is she going to do at this point especially if all she has is her entertainment business aspect right. but she could do that outside of hollywood that's how she started not if you're blacklisted in hollywood you're basically blacklisted from every bit of entertainment Everywhere. yeah at that point you're blacklisted Yeesh. you are blacklisted yeah like no one's going to touch you if hollywood has blacklisted you yeah, that does make sense. So basically what we've established here is that cancel culture is not new. <laughs> mm, mm Oh, God, no. Nothing that we are dealing with right now is new. Oh. To us, it's new. <laughs> so I don't want to hear anything about kids these days canceling people too easily. I'm like, I'm done with that narrative now, okay? <laughs> yeah, like you even mentioned the word communist and you're done. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, on a more relatable note, she also said that if others saw her as successful, then they must see something that she doesn't. 
Yeah, Audrey saw all kinds of things in herself that she saw as flaws. She was like, like we've been talking about, she was really quite insecure in a lot of ways. She was never really good enough for herself and it didn't matter how many awards she won, how many movies she made, none of it changed that deep set insecurity, which was just a mind boggling realization for me because I was sitting there watching a documentary about her on Netflix, like I mentioned, and watching her like grow through her career, thinking what an absolutely gorgeous woman. Like she really is just the embodiment of elegance and grace and like just absolutely stunning woman. And there's these images of her just like casually posing without even being aware that the camera is like there and her voice is playing over them. And she's talking about all the things that she'd change about her body. And now all I can think is that like, Audrey Hepburn, possibly one of the most beautiful women of all time, was insecure about her body, her work, everything, for so much of her life. And it seems that it all became worse in her later years, too. Like, it didn't get better. And, like, if Audrey Hepburn couldn't be confident looking like that, like, what hope is there for the rest of us? Right? Like, uh, like it just really, it, like shines a great big spotlight on like like on how we all need just like a big pers a great big old perspective shift we all think it like if i just look like so and so if i just look like her if i just look like him then i wouldn't be so insecure about myself but like that's not how it works no. you have to face that insecurity head on your body changing is not going to change your mindset you've you've got to tackle the head stuff before you can worry about the rest because Someone phrased it, and I can't remember who, and that's going to bother me, but someone phrased it in a really good way. Like, if you weren't enough without the abs, you're not going to be enough with the abs, essentially, is what they're saying. If you aren't enough without the muscles, if you aren't enough without the long hair, the short hair, the colored hair, the whatever, if you aren't enough without that, you're not going to be enough with that. You have to find a way to allow yourself, to give yourself the space to be enough yeah. without that, because... Otherwise, it's not going to be any different. You're always going to find things to hate for your, like to hate yourself for if you're looking for them. Well, and like Marilyn Monroe's quote of if you don't love me at my worst, then you don't deserve me at my best. It works mm -hmm. for yourself as well. Like if you don't yeah. love yourself at your worst times and like the worst that you go look or whatever, then you don't mm -hmm. deserve yourself at your best either. Yeah, exactly. And like Marilyn Monroe, she may have seemed super... <laughs> like proud of herself that girl was a mess on the inside I'm like not terribly surprised to hear that and stuff right so it's like like she has something there <laughs> so when audrey was announced for the leading role in the movie adaptation of my fair lady the public became upset as everyone was under the impression that audrey stole that role from julie andrews who played it on broadway Audrey Hepburn felt guilty for that and underqualified. She sang some of her lines as Eliza Doolittle, the ones before Eliza goes through speech therapy in the film, but her songs after the speech therapy were dubbed over with Marnie Noxon's voice, as the studio thought that her voice wouldn't be able to compare to Julie Andrews, even after taking singing lessons for the role. Interesting. She complained about it, but she wasn't taken seriously. She felt that the press would turn on her for this, and it added to her insecurities. Okay. I just looked at that because I was like, hang on, didn't Julie Andrews, like, lose her voice fairly early on? But no, it wasn't until 1997 that she had the surgery that she mm -hmm. couldn't sing the same way. So I was like, hang on, I didn't need to feel too bad. But I'm like, but I'm like, mm -hmm. no, wait, nope, never mind. <laughs> yeah, so people felt like she stole the role, but it wasn't really like that. Hang on. Well, I mean, it's kind of the same thing with Leah Michelle right now in... Funny Girl, I think, on Broadway. Um, that, she, that they're like, oh, she's now stealing the role from Beanie and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, there's something wrong with the show <laughs> that it wasn't yeah. doing well. So they decided to cast somebody that had a little bit more clout and stuff, right? Like, that the show themselves <laughs> did it, not Leah. <laughs> Right? Like, that's the thing, is that, like, even if that was the case, it wasn't necessarily Audrey Hepburn's fault. If it wasn't her, it would have been someone else, right? Mm hmm But, yeah, Andrews addressed this, like, Julie Andrews addressed this later. She said that she wasn't, like, disappointed with it. Like, she was she was fine with this happening. So it's, like, kind of, kind of the thing of people just, like, assuming that it's a problem and then reacting as if it's a problem. Um, yeah. But, yeah. 
to be honest, this is a direct quote. I'm like reading this, like I just dug this up right now, but, <laughs> but I'm reading this straight from a article from cheatsheet.com that yeah, is quoting an interview with her. To be honest, I didn't hold out much hope that I was going to get the role. Andrew said, I wished for it and wanted it, but I don't think I thought I would get it. So it wasn't as desperately awful a disappointment as people think that it might have been. So like, how yeah, much she wasn't time was there between turnout. Julie Andrews originating the role and the movie adaptation? Ah, uh, that's a good question. So the movie adaptation came in 1964. So around the same time that Julie Andrews was doing um, Mary Poppins, right? Uh, 1956 was when it was originally done. So like ten years okay. later. Yeah. So like. The Dear Evan, like, like if we take a look at this in a more modern take, Dear Evan mm-hmm. Hansen, they needed yes. to recast Ben yes. Platt in the movie version because yes. even on Broadway, he didn't quite look like a teenager. He really Anymore. didn't look like a teenager by the time for the movie. And, I, and it wasn't 10 years. That is a really good modern so if, equivalent. If Julie Andrews did it in the movie... People probably mm-hmm. would have been upset because it wasn't going to be the Broadway version that they expected. Exactly. They needed to recast it for somebody who was actually going to fit the role better in that time frame. That it would stick with the original character's age and look. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's... like. <sighs> It's a thing that makes sense, but it's very much like the public going like, oh, how dare you on her behalf? And then like, or, or she's sitting there like, this is not that big of a deal. Like, I don't like. <laughs> There's no winner in something like that. Yeah, no, no one wins. Uh, yeah, so she went through this and then she like, because there was like the public disappointment because um, there was like, it wasn't even her voice. And, like, she couldn't even, like, try to rise to the occasion and, like, show them that she was capable of doing it. Like, she just wasn't even allowed to, like, try. She was really, really worried that uh, the press was going to turn on her for this and they were going to, like, come at her for it. So, like I said, she's anxious about a lot of things. This this poor woman is anxious about so much. So, yeah, just to kind of, like, wrap up, more or less, we'll mention her career again in a little bit, but more or less to just kind of wrap up talking about her career. Because, like I said, there's so much more to her life than the movies that she was in, right? Um, But that being said, she did have a record-breaking career. She was one of the first women to make uh, over a million dollars as an actress. She earned an EGOT, which for listeners that don't know, this uh, is when a person wins an Emmy Award, a Grammy Award, an Oscar, and a Tony. I actually was counting on her fingers. (laughs) I forgot them all. Uh, And that makes her one of only 17 people to do so, as well as multiple BAFTA Awards, Golden Globe Awards, and uh, New York Film Critics Circle Awards. And in 1993, she won a Lifetime Achievement Award award from the Screen Actors Guild Awards after she had passed away. Yeah. Which is, like, yeah. yeah. Which is a huge deal. Um, And I wish she had won more. And she probably could have. (laughs) She probably could have if she chose to continue her career, but she backed out of it, so. Well, there's some stuff where she didn't win for that I was like, no! (laughs) That's fair, too. So yeah, so that pretty much wraps up like what I wanted to talk about with her career. There's so much more that we could talk about. There's so many movies that we could go into. There's so many more anecdotes. I really do recommend this documentary. It does like it interviews like her family, like her kids, uh, her son and her granddaughter as well, um, as like friends and like family friends and like friends of people that knew her and things like that. Um, it interviews like a whole lot of people and then uses like clips from interviews with her uh, as well. It only just came out in 2020. Um, so definitely if you've got Netflix, go check it out. It's just called Audrey on Netflix. Yeah. And it is in our sources. So ironically for such a private person, we're going to talk about her personal life for a little bit. <laughs> yep. So her first husband was married to her for nearly two decades. I got a couple conflicting numbers, so I'm not sure exactly. I think it's around 17 years and he was an actor and a producer as well. They worked together and consulted each other for projects but he was also very demanding and this eventually led to them getting divorced. She did have a son with them. Uh, and this is when at the height of her career, she pulled back in order to spend more time with her son, which made her happier than working on films anyway. So it yeah. worked out for her. Well, she's such a family person with her lack of family. So much. So that's, um, that's one thing that her granddaughter said was that she figured that she was just always looking for an unconditional 
familial love and she was always trying to achieve that and she was just always looking for that and so it like to nobody's surprise she chose family over this career that she didn't see as being that big of a deal anyway (laughs) just crazy because she's Audrey Hepburn so yeah so she took a few roles here and there but not nearly at the pace that she had before and like she was just she was really trying to dial it back and like step out of the limelight after this marriage, she'd had multiple other relationships. People speculated that she was looking for the love that she never received from her father in those relationships. Of course, like purely psychologically, it's probably true to an extent, but a running theme in Audrey's life is her desperation to be loved, but not in like a superficial celebrity kind of way, like in a real meaningful yeah. sort of way. Yeah. So it makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely makes sense. And I mean, like, as somebody who also didn't really, like, didn't grow up with, like, a father figure, like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that I looked for a father, like, for, like, somebody, like, to kind of, like, rip, like, to give me that kind of love. It was more that I looked for somebody who wasn't going to be, like, what I knew he would be, right? Right. Um. So I think that that might be even, like, what she was kind of doing, where she was, like, are you going to be like my father, and yeah. or like, how are you going to treat like the children and myself? Like looking at how I was treated, how my mother was treated, mm. and what do I not want to do or have happen with my family? Her big focus was abandonment. Her big focus and everything that I heard, everything that I read, was that she just didn't want to be abandoned the same way. So she was just looking for someone who wouldn't do that. And so you kind of see that with these marriages that last like over a decade. Like she didn't really like she didn't have any. Like, she had other relationships, she dated other people, but she didn't marry anyone who she wasn't married to for at least 10 years. Yeah. So she really was just looking for someone that would just stay, that just wouldn't leave. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's not a high bar, guys. (laughs) Yeah, even still. (sighs) Even still. Yeah. Yeah, she desper- She also desperately wanted to keep her private life private, and she said that she had always been shy. It just so happened that it was easier to be a shy ballerina than a shy actress, mm-hmm. and she wasn't really trying for the actress route, but she ended up there, and so she was just trying to, you know, make the best of it. She just wanted to be like a normal person living a normal life. For a while, she followed a man to Rome, uh, but paparazzi followed her everywhere, and it made her very anxious to be watched. She had a son with him in 1970, and she loved them dearly, but he was also followed by the paparazzi as well. And uh, they took pictures of him with over 200 other women. Yep. That is so many. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you have that kind of time? My guy, you have a wife and a child. Are you serious? Remember when I said the bar was not high? <laughs> I limboed under it. Uh, yeah, so who knows if he was cheating with all of them or many of them, whatever. It doesn't matter. She was absolutely devastated by it. Her and rightfully friends say so. That you can see, and rightfully so. Her friends say that you can see the light kind of dull in her eyes uh, in photos from this time. Yeah. It's just sad. No, I've seen it. She, she allegedly had a romantic affair with another actor closer to the end of the marriage. But, like, if your hu- husband cheats on you with that many women, I think the relationship's over long before they're officially divorced. So, like... Yeah, like, what did he, like, at that point, it's almost like, okay, what did you think was going to happen? Like, Yeah. She's not getting any kind of love from you, so she's going to try to find it somewhere else. Yeah. So she hated that the press were so disrespectful of her privacy while she was there as well. Like, they were everywhere, and it just kept getting worse, and it just kept making more anxious, and this time of her life, and, like, making this time of her life even more of a struggle than it already was going to be with the cheating husband. So, As I said, a f- reminiscent <laughs> of Princess Di. Right. All right. Okay. So, fortunately, she did manage to divorce this guy. Uh, and a few years later, she met Robert Wolders, and he turned out to be the true love of her life. They never married, but she felt secure, safe, connected. She said that they considered themselves married, even though it was never official. Unfortunately, this one was cut short when cancer uh, came and took over her life. And, uh, yeah. I'm trying to say this gently, Ashley. <laughs> when she lost her battle to cancel cancer, this relationship was cut short. And that's really unfortunate because from the sounds of things, this was the this was the one. This was the healthy one. This yep. was the healthiest one. This is the thing that she had been searching for. Yep. I was only a few months old when she passed. I wasn't born. Obviously, because you're years older than me. <laughs> so, uh, near the end of her life, 
she also did a lot of work, non like movie related work, she did a few roles here and there, but she did a lot of work with UNICEF and became a Goodwill ambassador in 1988. So you dancing about this part. Yes, I am. <laughs> she worked with them from 1988 onto the, like for the rest of her life afterwards, uh, happily supporting the organization that had once helped save her. UNICEF and the Red Cross were among or other, like, were among organizations that uh, came in after Holland's liberation with food, medicine, and supplies for civilians. She said it was a way of using the voice and the attention that she gained from her Hollywood career for the good of children. She worked as a messenger, traveling to different areas and bringing awareness to the social needs of children and families around the world. She had hoped that after the war, after World War II, that no child would have to suffer the way that she had. And now she was traveling the world, seeing children starve anyway. She was absolutely devastated and desperate to do everything that she could to help. She, at one point, said that she always had seen her retirement as being, like, settling down finally and not traveling anymore and just taking care of her home and her garden and her dogs and her kids and just, like taking care of her life and the things that she really truly cherishes um but for these kids she would travel the world again for these kids she would do anything oh yeah uh, go to the ends of the earth she was so passionate about this so yeah she spent the rest of her life dedicated to the gods in 1992 she was fighting cancer and even still she went to france kenya somalia switzerland the uk and the u.s to continue bringing awareness and trying desperately to serve as a voice for starving children. She left a statement of hope saying, quote, as we move into the 21st century, there is much to reflect upon. We look around us and see that the promises of yesterday have come to pass. People still live in abject poverty. People are still hungry. People still struggle to survive. And among these people, we see the children, always the children, their enlarged bellies, their sad eyes, their wise faces that show the suffering, all the suffering they had endured in their short years. And she desperately wanted us to come together and to resolve this and to work together and to like change this for the future so that this did not have to happen anymore. That's all that she wanted yeah and it's such a long goal and it's one that we still like haven't achieved and it seems unlikely that we're going to but it's such just it's just noble it's just yeah yeah and like every time when you see film like footage of her in general versus her on these missions and with these children like even while like in 92 while she was mm -hmm. battling cancer and like you could watch like her decline from like the photographs and the footage and everything the change in her demeanor that mm. fire and that light and compassion that would just all of a sudden just flood into her features mm -hmm. and her eyes like it's just like goosebumps every time when I see it like you can just see that change in her the moment she sets foot on these missions and she sees these kids yeah like it's just it's well, this, the most beautiful thing about her to me oh totally and this quote comes uh from shortly after her trip to Somalia where things were particularly bad as well and she was just like that fire was really lit in her and she was like absolutely like desperate to do something and to like drive home the point that this doesn't need to happen anymore yeah all right and so shortly after only a few months after actually after this tour well tour is not the right word for this like after yeah only a few months after this trip at 63 audrey hepburn died at her home in switzerland uh in january 1993 yeah and that is the more or less brief overview of the life of Audrey Hepburn. And like I said, there is so, so, so much more out there. I feel mm -hmm. like our like episode subjects, we're really just doing snapshots into them because there is so much more to be discovered. So yeah, check the sources. Go watch, if you got Netflix, go watch that uh, Audrey Hepburn documentary. And if you don't, pirate it somewhere. I don't know. I don't care. I'm not telling you what to do. <laughs> I'm just saying that you can. Like, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. For legal reasons, don't do that. Or don't tell them I sent you. I don't know live your life all right well james dean and audrey hepburn did yeah. they have a secret affair probably not because it kind of sounds like she hated him but i don't think they ever like fully met <laughs> they probably never met like, they oh i mean he did other. pass away like earlier on in her career so i think if he had stayed alive they probably would have met yeah probably even done a movie together but 
Because <laughs> she seemed to have done a movie with like every other amazing leading man out there. With him trying to ad lib everything, and I feel like it would just send her straight into a mental breakdown, though. Because I would pay to watch that scene. set. <laughs> I the behind the scenes footage. I don't think I like. I don't think you could pay me to watch that because I feel like it'd just be so tragic, like just watching her lose her mind over it. Like, I, I would like happily be a fly on the wall her. just to swatch <laughs> and like... see because I think I think I think James would have been I think James just knowing his personality, he mm-hmm. probably would have been like, okay, like let's come to like a middle ground. <laughs> we need an agreement here <laughs> because I think he'd be too gentlemanly to yeah. like really screw with her that's fair but he and still wanted would... to have some say an ad lib <laughs> an but she's such a people pleaser she would have let him but she would have been panicking the entire time on the inside like she wouldn't have stopped him probably but like you know like she she'd do whatever she could to work with it but then she'd like criticize herself internally about not being able to do it well enough like I don't know. Maybe we would have seen another side of her. Absolutely not. No. (laughs) Maybe we would have seen, like, the bohemian dance side of her with it. Like, it would actually be interesting to see, like, what that would have turned out like. Oh, man. Two very different personalities. (laughs) Yeah. But next week, we can talk about two very similar personalities as we kick off our first, like, our kind of, like, intro to our two months of spooky... (laughs) Which really, we've Spooky already been season. dark. We've already been dark, but we're going to like cement into the dark <laughs> and spooky for two months. The themes are very Halloween related. Let's put it that way. Yeah, but yeah. So next week, I think is when we talk about Bram Stoker and Mary Shelley. Yes, I get to talk about my queen. Yeah, freaking love Shelley. I get to get all English. And Scottish. Honestly, I might not even write a script for next week. I and might Irish. just start saying, like, everything off of the top of my head and just be like, oh, Mary Shelley, and just gush about her for an hour. <laughs> you go for that. I've already started the script for Bram, and I have gotten very <laughs> studious, just like him. <laughs> all right, all right. I get an extra, uh, get, I get Monday off this week. Surprise, surprise. So I might actually Woo! just sit down all Monday and just research Mary Shelley and just live my life like that. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, we do get Monday off. For the Queen's funeral. Mm-hmm. Long live Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah. Bram Stoker and Mary Shelley. Super excited to talk about Mary Shelley. Um, Got two of our yeah. horror writers. Yes. <laughs> that were influenced by a lot of other amazing horror writers. Yes, 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 yes. I love Mary Shelley. She has a lot of really good anecdotes. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find my favorites and we're going to talk about them. Yeah. So that's next week. Thanks I will talk about bloodletting. <laughs> what are you talking about? That makes sense. Bram Stoker, Dracula, bloodletting. Yep, I get uh-huh. it. I see the connection. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mary Shelley uh, does not talk about bloodletting. She talks about reviving the dead piece by piece. Um, but, but again, we're we're gonna next time. Next time. Yeah. This time. Thanks for hanging out with us today as we ramble on and on and on about Golden Age Hollywood. But for today, that's all from us. So we'll see you next week. Bye bye.